Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, we'll be exploring integral resilience. My guest is Julian Gresser, an attorney, former visiting professor at Harvard University Law School and MIT. He's also taught law in Japan. He is the author of Environmental Law in Japan, as well as Partners in Prosperity, a book about U.S.-Japanese relationships in business and technology. As and also Piloting Through Chaos, a book about negotiation, The Explorer's Mind, a book about scientific development, The Laughing Heart, a book about emotional intelligence, and Integral Resilience. Welcome, Julian. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you, one of my old friends. Very, very old friend and I want to congratulate you at our mutual age that you remembered all those titles. <laughs> Quite extraordinary. <laughs> well, and you wrote them all. Many, you're very interdisciplinary, Julian. I guess you could say that. I, I mean, really, your, your work touches on many, many different fields, everything from technology to spirituality. And, uh, your choice of resilience as a topic to focus on uh, expresses exactly that. It is a topic that touches almost every other discipline. Well, I think that's true. And it's, uh, I mean, I didn't intend it to be that way. I sort of came upon it, uh, you might say, serendipitously. Uh, as you mentioned, a number of books that I've written, <clears throat> the negotiation book began with this concept of integrity capacity to stay connected, coherent, adaptively alive. And that then evolved to <clears throat> an interest in what I call big heart intelligence, which, inter which looks at the role of the heart as well as the mind and the gut uh, that came out of some training with the great Chinese uh, Qigong Grandmaster Li Feng. And so it was the natural, since I was interested in integral uh, exploration, and the heart itself is an integrating faculty, that I began to be interested in resilience, which, of course, all great negotiators are resilient. But what I didn't realize, which really was the discovery, as I uh, put the, the term resilience against subjects that I had been interested in in my life, for example, uh, mitochondria. Uh, I've been interested in the relationship of how mitochondria are often impaired in many ocular illnesses and that we can actually detect this using something called adaptive optics. But there it was, staring right at me, all the frontier work that linked resilience to mitochondria or mitochondria impairment. And then I went to inflammation or uh, uh, other uh, the hyperglycemia. Up comes resilience, leading studies on resilience and hypoglycemia. So I put in pain management, and there I get the NIH new paradigm, resilience. Uh, so I figured, okay, I'll leave the sciences, and I'll go to climate change, global poverty, technology networks. Resilience turns out to be fundamental for all these disciplines. And I should define what I mean. Okay. Because I think that would be helpful for the, the audience. So, the usual notion of resilience is the capacity to bounce back. But why would we want to bounce back if where we were wasn't so great? And I've always remembered that wonderful line from As You Like It in Shakespeare. It says, sweet are the uses of adversity, Shakespeare wrote. But why is adversity sweet? What's sweet about it? So I got interested, maybe we could define resilience or integral resilience as the capacity to turn, as Shakespeare said, adversity to advantage. 
Well, I know um, back when I was a freshman in college, as I was telling you a little earlier, they had a big sim- freshman symposium at the University of Wisconsin, uh, 500 people or maybe 1,500 all in one lecture hall. And they brought in different speakers every week to talk about stress as a unifying theme that would cover everything from male-female relationships to chemical interactions. And uh, it seems to me that resilience is like that. It's a concept that uh, can work in, in in every dimension. But with regard to stress, there was this notion called eustress, which is positive stress, that people benefit from a certain amount of stress in their lives. And I would think uh, that, you know, bouncing back or using eustress to achieve even higher levels of performance uh, makes sense. But uh, that has to be just, you know, not too hot and not too cold. The, the the amount of stress, it has to be just right. If stress is overwhelming, then I would think it's very hard even to bounce back to where you were before the stressor. Yeah, I think that's prob- probably true. Uh, <clears throat> and what I have uh, tried to um, <laughs> make clear as I developed this idea um, is that Several, several important points I should mention. First of all, I view, as from what I've learned, that integral resilience is a core life competency. Core life competency. And in addition to being a core life competency, it's actually a skill that you can learn, that anyone can learn, that any, any individual, a team, an organization, an entire community. Now, I, I, def- I begin with in trying to explain integral resilience as a state of being you can actually experience of, begins with a sense of heightened vitality. You feel, you feel greatly alive, empowered, you feel powerful. Uh, a sense of joy comes naturally from this balance. And because you have this sense of joy and power and heightened vitality, you naturally feel grateful for the gift of life. It's a sense of flow and finally love. Now, often people split these feelings apart. For example, heightened vitality and gratitude. What does this have to do with empowerment? But I find that these are all integrated together and this is an experience. That when you feel this way, when you know that you know the sense of integral resilience, then the stresses of the world become you become part of the natural landscape. You're able to move through them. You're able to adapt. You're able to I can't say embrace your suffering, but that you can be. You don't have to ha- approach it with aversion. You can be present to it, and you can find your power inside your pain. And I think this is at the core, because it's very easy to be resilient when everything goes your way. What makes resilience really challenging is to be able to deal with the dark places, the shadow, the difficult part, and it's the ability to move through these things. Well, you know, you're reminding me of the fact that the last time we were together in this studio was about a year and a half ago. And uh, at that time, you were, as I remember, you were forced to leave your home in Santa Barbara, California, because of devastating uh, fire and flooding and landslides. And uh, the city of Santa Barbara uh, has has been through an enormous amount of of stress. I think uh, just last week I was reading about fires. Well, that's true. The fires, I think, came up from uh, Carpinteria or Ventura, but we had alerts. I mean, I was in Dallas, mm. but uh, you could hardly breathe. People had masks on. Imagine in, in a city like that. And Santa Barbara has been known as uh, an affluent city, and many people would describe it almost as an optimal community. It's gorgeous. It's the home of Ronald Reagan, among other famous people. Uh, so that would be an example of... Uh, 
a situation uh, where resilience is called for. Well, that's right. And actually, I have a project which the uh, Santa Barbara Foundation has been kind enough to support, which I call Resilient Santa Barbara. And it really puts into test these ideas at a whole community-wide level. Can, as you say, can an entire city that faces a catastrophe, I mean, then mudslides killed 23 people, including children and so forth, just in a second. People are just simply in their beds, and they woke up to an onslaught of mud, and it took their children away in one second. And in really, you can say, well, in an odd way, we don't know, we don't believe, we're not used to life being that way. Uh, how can one, how can, if you were a parent, and these are people I know that well, who lost their children, they couldn't ever find their children. How do you deal with sorrow like that? Yeah. Uh, and yet we, you know, that is what we, ha if we are alive, we live and we go on. But I'm saying is that these are, this is a true skill that one can develop. I just saw this remarkable movie, Harriet on the life of Harriet Tubman. I mean, if you needed a historical example of what I'm talking about, this is an amazing story of a person who more, was born a slave um, and not only survived sl slavery and escaped, but turned the agony of her experience into an extraordinary opportunity to help others. Mm -hmm. It's the helping others part, which is, I think, core to what I'm talking about, which gives one the sense of power because you take from your suffering, you help reduce the suffering of others. And it was amazing. I mean, she saved, she, well, in one case, 70, 70 slaves, but then there was a, she was the head of a battalion. I think they saved another 900. I mean, it was an extraordinary messy. And uh, throughout it all was a sense of faith, a sense of belief and a deep connection to the universe, and really love, and and a sense of s profound self-reliance, which was the other characteristic, I think, that comes out in that movie. That's an excellent example, isn't it? And uh, another one that just occurs to me now, I happen to know from discussions we've had years ago, that you come from a long line of rabbis. And the Jewish people, let's face it, the Jewish people uh, were around uh, at the time of the pharaohs and, and even uh, earlier and uh, thousands of years ago. Very few ethnic groups have survived as long as the Jews, especially when you consider they didn't have a homeland for 2,000 years mm. or so. And my understanding is that one of the reasons that the Jewish people have survived the way they did is because in spite of centuries of persecution, they always found a way to uh, sing, to dance, to uh, relish the little pleasures that life offered them, even in the midst of great misery. Well, I think I think that's that's really true, and of course, accompanying also, which is characteristic, I think, of the Jewish people, of humor. Mm -hmm. uh, there's something about the capacity to to lighten up, uh, to take to. I mean, you see this very apparently in Dickens, and uh, so much of his great work is this very close line between tragedy and sorrow and humor, often in the same paragraph. It's really extraordinary how this juxtaposition that you see the absurdity of life, the humor of life, the joy of life, even at the point of tragedy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that has given, you mentioned Jewish people, uh, it's part of the secrets of, of their resilience. Humor, mm -hmm. the ability to in so many ways, sort of accept the world and sort of flow with it. Well, you've also worked uh, in Japan extensively. And now that I think about resilience, the Japanese people recovering from two nuclear bombs on two of their cities uh, and bouncing back to become a, an economic technological uh, powerhouse as well as a center of uh, deep spiritual traditions, uh, is another uh, excellent example. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, the, the historic uh, case in Japan begins at the 
arrival of the Kurofune, the black ships of Perry. This was a feudal society, and the uh, American ships under Commodore Perry sh show up, and Japan is challenged, and they see uh, a greater military force, although the Japanese samurai tradition is amazing. Uh, and they were able, which is one of the great historical examples, they had the resilience to adapt to this challenge, whereas the Qing dynasty in China had been very corrupt and uh, there was um, disempowered through opium and so forth. But the Japanese were able almost in a matter of a few years to transform their society. Uh, and it was, came out of this extraordinary, as you say, cultural, cultural resilience. Mm -hmm. I'm reading an amazing book, um, on the life of Miyamoto Musashi. He was Japan's greatest samurai. Um, but the uh, the writer, the interesting writer, mentions and highlights that not only was Miyamoto probably the greatest swordsman in the history of Japan, but he embodied this concept of bonbu, bun or bun in Chinese and Japanese means culture. Bu is the way of the warrior. He was an extraordinary artist, extraordinary gardener, extraordinary sculptor. He, I mean, he had so many different talents a poet, an author. He brought all these different qualities together that not only infused his so art of the sword, but that his sword then informed the other. And I think this notion of bringing culture together with high military art uh, in, a, in, a, in an integrated art form is a the, and this is not only Miyamoto. Many of the daimyo, the, the great lords in Japan, as well as samurai, were also artists. Mm -hmm. And so this bringing together of culture, along with sort of the discipline and muscularity of, of martial arts, uh, and you see this in China as well, is at the core of resilience. Mm -hmm. Well, wait, since you brought up China as, as an example, I remember uh, in my lifetime when China seemed like an absolute economic basket case. It was way, way, way behind Japan. And now, as far as I know, the Chinese economy is stronger than the Japanese e e economy. They've made, just in the last 30 years, incredible leaps forward way beyond what I would have imagined would have been possible. But at a terrible price. What is the price they paid? Terrible price. Well, th th there are several aspects. Of the first is the decline in, in civil liberties. Hmm. Um, very, I mean, Xi Jinping has reversed Deng Xiaoping's uh, policies. Uh, much more repressive, much more curtailing of rights. The second is uh, pollution. Mm. Um, I, you know, I, I lectured in Chinese in China on environmental law in, it must have been in, in the late 70s. The Chinese were very innovative. Uh, they, did, they were among the world's first countries that had recognized in the Constitution an environmental right. <clears throat> but just as in Japan, the Japanese used to sort of embrace the idea of cities of smoke. They called Kemuri no Miyako in Japanese. It was wonderful, and that led to Minamata disease and all these terrible... In, in China now, the price has been terrible because of the air, mm -hmm. the water, the pollution of the land. You know, So the externalized cost uh, of this massive in de development has been borne by the people. It has not been borne by the industry. Well, the Japanese have Fukushima. Well, the Japanese have Fukushima. <laughs> Which is an incredible disaster. It's an incredible disaster. Creating radiation that's spreading throughout the entire ocean. Yeah, yeah, and continues today. Mm -hmm. But if you don't mind, I just will segue <laughs> to something yeah. that is really quite current mm -hmm. for me which is, and we don't have to go into it to any greater length than you want, but I think it is important on this issue of China. Okay. There's a video of Chinese kids, uh, uh, which I think Chinese are quite proud of, and they have, they have bands around their head. Uh, and it's to try to show the wonders of so-called 5G. And a little kid in the school, you know, all the little kids are there, decides to look out of the window at a bird. Maybe the sun glittering on a leaf. And a signal is sent to the teacher who's got the, her computer right there. And the, the kid is now set up for punishment 
and a report is sent to the parents. Now, this is the world of 5G, AI, and the Internet of Things. And the Chinese, uh, particularly with Huawei, which has most of the patents, uh, seeks to be the world leader in 5G. And the United States, under our present president, wants to out China, China. Now, the effects of 5G, AI, and so forth will be profound in terms of the health effects. And we have very well documented <clears throat> the costs of this and uh, the impairment of resilience across a whole spectrum of illnesses, as well as uh, invasion of privacy, because wireless technology basically insecure. A, this technology was originally used for <clears throat> um, controlling the enemy in military combat, and it's been now commercialized and so forth. My point is here that there are villages in China where the water is impotable, where you can breathe the air, are now proud to have 5G. This is going to have a profound effect on impairing the resilience of China. And many of these illnesses we know have comorbidity. You're going to see a dramatic increase of health-related harms in China. And what part of my work is, is to try to anticipate this and help the United States build a more res integrally resilient industrial infrastructure. Well, you've raised a very important point. We've done a previous program on this channel about the uh, inherent dangers uh, of 5G, the use of, of these military you know, wavelengths, and uh, how with the Internet of Things uh, going on, we will be saturated with uh, a whole new uh, spectrum of electromagnetic signals passing through our bodies every day, and uh, the health effects are, are very likely to be you know, quite deleterious to people. And uh, the political pressure to institute 5G is very strong. I understand, for example, that uh, regulations have been passed in Washington forbidding local uh, municipalities from regulating 5G at all. That's correct. And many local municipalities... <clears throat> feel the word you hear all the time, our hands are tied. We cannot perform our fiduciary obligation to protect the health, the resilience of our communities, because the FCC has a rule that is actually encouraging the telecom industry to sue local municipalities, Huntington Bay, New York being a good example, that try to say, I mean, you, your whole life has been uh, devoted to the exploration of wisdom, right? I mean, so many different aspects of your research and interviews. The most fundamental learning we get from all the world's wisdom traditions is if something looks baleful, to pause, to not go faster, to assess, to explore, to reach a reason judgment. Now, I'm not in any way a technophobe. I mean, there are benefits. The IEEE has noticed this. But the costs of this this industrial juggernaut are so profound that local communities wisely should inform themselves. That's the most basic core of democracy. That's where resilience, democracy come together, to inform themselves of the risk and to reach wise decisions. And this is an industrial policy, because as you mentioned my book on partners and prosperity, that it's a rogue industrial policy. This is wildly off the tracks, and the impact it will have on impairing and tearing down the resilience of local communities, of states, and so forth will be profound unless we approach this in a more enlightened and intelligent way, which is perhaps the subject of another uh, interview. But this is directly on our main theme today, which is not only how is resilience impaired, but how can it be fortified? How can one develop this sense of robustness at every level of society? Well, and 5G is one example, but there are many, many things coming down the pipe right. in, in the realm of technology, uh, the consequences of which we have no idea, but they're going to come. Artificial intelligence mm. uh, being one example, uh, new genetic engineering being another. 
Yeah. And so I think what is, to stay on our main theme, what's useful about this concept of resilience is that it allows you to kind of move into a subject in a way that is not ideological, that has a scientific basis to it, because we actually can, at an individual level or an organizational level, we can measure this. We can measure the present status of resilience. I have a whole questionnaire and so forth. <clears throat> and as resilience develops as an organizational skill, then an organization can understand, well, is it becoming less or more so in specific in which ways and how to refine it and so forth and so on. Um, so uh, it gives us a way to look and judge and, and assess and reach wise decisions that embody not only the power of our mind, but the power of our heart. I give you a specific example, if you want, just for a minute more, if we stay on this subject, though I agree with you, we can go to many others. But, uh, you know, Elon Musk is clearly a genius. I mean, he's done so many amazing things. Uh, uh, but one of, and he, for years, he railed against artificial intelligence. But, you know, he is bringing us 30,000 satellites, or part of them, that are going to beam down this sort of, this frequency. Now, it should be brought out to your audience that 5G is what happens when you're in a scanner at an airport. That's 50 gigahertz. So they allow you, I put it this way, when was the last time you spent a week in a scanner? <laughs> <laughs> so they allow you three seconds. Yeah. And they're purporting to suggest that communities spend 24-7 forever under this exposure. It's like there'll be no going back. There'll be no going back. That is the point. This is irreversible. And Elon has a company called Neuralink. Now, Neuralink is a very interesting company. They're embedding AI chips in people's brains. Now, people, they're not doing it forcefully. People may want to have, perhaps there are benefits for it. I mean, maybe you have all of encyclopedic knowledge at your at your finger, at your mind tip. Mm -hmm. So you could say, and there may be medical applications. So, okay. But what is the shadow? What if, what if it were be possible to have a business plan in which you could profit from your thoughts? Can you imagine that? This is not at all inconceivable. So we're, our theme of resilience is, is this going, poses this question. Will this new frontier technology make communities, individuals, happier, more adaptive, more resilient, or will it impair them? Will it, will it make them less vital, more robo robotized, if I can use that word, less able to judge and pause and to come in touch with everything that is beautiful and nourishing and peaceful in life. Well, it seems as if in a capitalist society, we're operating under the general present uh, premise that if some company can make a profit from uh, a particular technology, it's likely to happen. Well, that <laughs> you've just put your your finger exactly on it because what's happening is that that profit. This term profit is actually, it needs to have quotation marks around it. Because, in the, ca in the case of what we're talking about, first of all, the external, what economists call the externality, the, the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, let's say billions of dollars, of uncompensated harms are basically, we have a, pub a policy called the public pays policy, public mm. pays principle. In other words, this industry would not be profitable if it had to bear the true social costs of doing business. And this is not even including all of the invasion of privacy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are laws on the books for all of this. California just passed, you know, a Data Privacy Act, and not to mention the consumer protection statutes at the mm -hmm. federal and state. So all of these laws are being pushed aside, this mass of subsidy is being sort of used as an operating principle. And this doesn't include uh, the core point of the irregulators versus FCC lawsuit. And the irregulators lawsuit is basically found massive 
counting irregularities going on for 20 years, 20 years, in which the FCC has basically turned an eye, a, a, turned its head away from the core fact that originally, under about tw 20 years ago, we had a national policy in favor of the information superhighway. This information superhighway was based on fiber wired to the home. And somehow or other, this all got diverted. Taxpayers' funds have got diverted to subsidize the wireless industry away from fiber wired. Mm -hmm. And ratepayers across the country for 20 years, it's to an amount that's so staggering, over a trillion dollars, over a trillion dollars, have been overcharged <clears throat> to the detriment of fiber wired. So fiber wired has been made to be uncompetitive to the advantage of wireless. So you have, on top of the externalities, you have a massive subsidy, and you can say, well, this is the profit. Well, the question is, there are laws that are challenging this, yeah. and what we are going to see is a huge shift over the next months and years in which the wireless industry, I think, although it looks like it's sort of completely out of control profitable, is going to be able to face its true cost, which I think is wonderful because it's going to create massive new incentives, which is why I'm here in, in Albuquerque today, for a whole new initiative called Peace Engineering, in which universities and industries around the world will start looking and saying, asking the question, let's not just give up on these decisions and sort of say, well, let the market decide. Clearly, in this case, the market is dysfunctional. So therefore, what's going to happen is new opportunities for industries and companies to say, how can we become more resilient? How can we bring on the line heart together with mind and intelligent decisions to develop technologies and products that nourish people, that nourish society? Now, I'm not just saying that there are no benefits for, for wireless. Of course there are. Uh, and the IEEE has noted these. The question is, how can this not be what I call a tragic choice? In other words, we have to have 5G and we're going to ignore all the other. No, no, no. There are new innovative ways where the wireless industry can actually take a lead along with fiber wired, but it can't be just what's best for the wire company's shareholders. No, this is too fundamental. It has to be what best, cui bono, what's best for all of us. And I think this is where resilience comes really into the fair. Mm -hmm. How do we develop an industrial infrastructure that is resilient and compassionate? And I think we have all the tools, the legal tools, the brains, the heart, to do that. In reading your book, Integral Resilience, I came across something I didn't know about that I thought was fascinating, that the Rockefeller Foundation has an initiative called, I think the name of it is 100RC, and I, I believe by that they, uh, they want to have uh, 100 cities who have a chief resilience officer and the Rockefeller Foundation will pay their salary for the first two years. Yeah. They believe after that, I guess, that the, the value of such a person will, will have proven itself. Well, I think, yeah, that apparently I've been told, because when I read all of this and mm -hmm. put it in the book, I was so excited. Yeah. I figured, okay, let's get the Rockefeller Foundation to support Santa Barbara becoming a resilient city. Yeah. But the Rockefeller Foundation, for some reason, has, I don't know whether it's terminated the program, but they're not funding any new cities. They've chosen their hundred. They've chosen their hundred. Yeah. But actually, it's a thumping good idea. Uh -huh. uh, and if the Rockefeller Foundation, you know, representatives <laughs> listen and watch this interview, <laughs> I think we can applaud the idea. Uh, particularly if the term resilient city incorporates what I'm talking about, big heart intelligence. In other words, it's not just a, uh, it's not just the capacity to, in a sort of narrow way, deal with stress and turn, you know, adjust to it. No, it's this idea of adversity to advantage. The ability to see the big picture is what big heart intelligence is about. Yeah. It's to be able to take something that looks so it looks like a juggernaut, if you want to think of this in Aikido terms. This 5G AI Internet of Things juggernaut is coming at all of us. 
And I think it's heading downward. But what if we, to use this railroad metaphor combined with an Aikido metaphor, <laughs> what if we could throw a switch? What if we could throw a switch so the train not only brings all of us downward, but brings all of us upward to higher ground, to a more compassionate uh, and, you know, pa compassionate, peaceful, generous way of living together with you? It's possible. It really is possible. You know, uh, in going over your book, and because you are an attorney, I know you've also focused quite a bit on the legal profession. Yes. And uh, we've seen that amongst lawyers uh, who are very important in dealing with these kinds of problems, very high rate of drug addiction, very high rate of suicide, very high rate of depression and other forms of mental illness. And I suspect that the many professions like this, doctors are also very high. Uh, I see construction workers now have a very high rate of suicide. If, if the mental health of the population as a whole seems to be wavering, you know, with, with Obesity is on the rise amongst uh, uh, other things. There, there needs to be uh, solutions for for just the everyday quotidian daily decisions uh, that people make because people it, it it seems that they feel like they're falling behind day after day and and they don't have the luxury of seeing the big picture. Well, I think that's I think that's really true, and I, you know, the the popular mind doesn't. <laughs> have much sympathy for lawyers. They forget, oh, you know, lawyers, they make so much money they <laughs> and they don't do it. It's all ill-begotten and they, they deserve what they get. But that's really not fair to lawyers. Uh, lawyers have made, in many ways, an important contribution. So I created a course. You know, lawyers have to continue to be educated in order to keep their license. Continuing is, education, continuing, many professions. This is now, called yeah. The Art of Human-Centered Lawyering. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first interview is with my old friend, Mark Davis. Mark Davis is a lawyer in Honolulu, wildly successful uh, personal injury lawyer. Won $30 million, $50 million settlement every few months. Just boom, 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 boom. So I interview Mark. And he has this really quite remarkable insight for the art of human-centered lawyering. And he said, the key, I said, what is the key to your success? He said, happiness. I said, what? You mean you're so successful, therefore you're happy? Uh-uh. Happiness is the enabling condition. <clears throat> he loves his work. He cares for his employees. Uh, he, 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 want, he picks his cases so they all embody social justice issues. That's how he's designed his career. Happiness has been the core enabling condition, the secret to his, his success. The very interesting book by uh, uh, Sean uh, uh, Acker, uh, The Happiness Advantage, he makes mm -hmm. the same point in terms of positive yeah. psychology. So, um, yeah, I think that's wonderful, but I know that most people... Actually, I don't know. I hypothesize that most people believe if they are successful, then they will be happy. I know. That sort of conditional happiness. Yeah. No. That's, this is a key part of what I'm talking about with integral resilience. The key to integral resilience, one of the keys, is unconditional happiness. To make happiness a key priority personal happiness, mm -hmm. which, of course, as I mentioned, in terms of this ability to pay it forward, to pass yeah. on happiness. Mm -hmm. uh, to, but there's an important point I just mentioned, because you hinted everybody is busy. Yeah. Busyness has become a national and international malady. Everybody's busy. So I've created something called Five Minutes to Resilience. In five minutes, you can begin to understand and experience <clears throat> the, the state of being that I mentioned. In fact, I'll give it to you in 30 seconds. Okay. Because we don't have, we don't have five minutes. <laughs> no, we do. We have five minutes uh, if right. you want to take five minutes. No. <laughs> i do it in 30 seconds, maybe less. A simple smile. Because we have these sort of elixirs now. We've got it in the form of an app. And you, you spin the, this heart wheel and it sort of synchronistically anticipates 
your concerns or challenges, and it gives you an, a, from a library of elixirs yeah. where I've titrated all my 76 years of sort of struggle on this earth down into what I thought would be useful. So the first one is a simple smile. Yeah. Now, are you aware that when I, or am I aware that when I smile, biochemically I'm producing all these positive hormones like oxytocin or serotonin mm. or dopamine or endorphins? So you can say, okay, well, that's what I'm talking about, resilience. But even more miraculous, you're smiling because I'm smiling. So your mirror neurons are now inducing these biochemical changes in Jeffrey as a function of our friendship and joy after so many years mm -hmm. to be back together again at this extraordinary moment. That's resilience. And it doesn't require money. It doesn't require anything. It's a natural gift that we all can experience and enjoy. That's wonderful. Julie, and I, I love that. I really do. I hear from viewers occasionally who, who, who say, why is Jeffrey smiling all the time? He's talking about serious subjects. Yeah. <laughs> Shouldn't he have a serious look on his no. face? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, this has nothing to do with not acknowledging suffering. Yeah. Uh, but life has many shadows and many, many different sort of qualities and nuances. And as I say, Dickens, who really understood sorrow and, and tragedy, saw, saw light inside the dark. And some of that comes out in humor and, and laughter. Without laughter and without joy, yeah. how, how, could we, how could we want to continue to live? Well, you quote Shakespeare often, and uh, nobody has really mastered the art of understanding tragedy, I don't think, better than Shakespeare, and yet he, he's wonderful when it comes to humor. Yeah, absolutely. I think you'll see in many of the great writers this appreciation, but I do agree that Shakespeare, perhaps more than anyone else, uh, has understood how these, these two go together. Mm -hmm. I think it really comes down... If you don't mind, one other quote from Shakespeare, which Not is my all. favorite quote, which is the last line or two of Henry V. And he says, small time, but in that small, most greatly lived. And so none of us know how long we, time we have. But what we do have is this small moment. And I think the art of integral resilience is can we live fully in this small time that is allotted to us? I, the, one of the other uh, five minutes to resilience uh, is this extraordinary work of Brother David Stundle Ross. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you you've interviewed, I've interviewed him. him in he's the a past. wonderful yes. person. Yeah, and uh, he summarized. I think. I mean, I've trained with Japan's greatest Zen teacher Yamada Kon, who's lived in the twentieth century, and uh, practiced and trained with some of the other great teachers in the United States. And David Stondel Ross summarizes it all in three words. Stop. Look. Look what's happening with Jeff and me in this wonderful opportunity, new thinking land. Stop, look, go. Go with the gift of life. That's resilience. That's at the core of what we're talking about. We cannot let this be impaired by technology or this. And I think this gives us a way for communities whether or not 5G is rolled out into your community, because people will naturally ask, well, what can I do about it? Uh, how do I protect myself? How do I protect my family? And it begins with developing your resilience, this inner core. And that begins with stop, look, go. Appreciate the gift of life right here. Well, Julian Gresser, what a powerful message that is, that uh, in dealing with the most complex and difficult of problems, and humanity is facing many of them now, the uh, inner core required to address those problems can be as simple as a smile. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for being with me, Julie. Yeah, really, as always, it's really a pleasure, Jeff. Thank this you. has been a wonderful discussion. And thank you for being with us.